Okay, well, good morning again. Uh, my name is Joe Siegel. I'm the Director of Research here at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. And on, half of the, on behalf of the International Growth Center at the London School of Economics and the Africa Center, I'd like to welcome everybody to today's event, uh, Understanding the Underlying Drivers of Armed Conflict in South Sudan. Um, our event this morning uh, is also uh, marking the US launch of the book, the Struggle for South Sudan, Challenges of Security and State Formation, edited by uh, two of our panelists, Luca Cole and Sarah Logan, and uh, mirroring some of the themes of the book. And our event today is hoping to focus on the underlying drivers of conflict in South Sudan, uh, because despite repeated attempts to negotiate some sort of settlement to the fighting, uh, South Sudan has uh, largely become synonymous with conflict. Um, you know, and especially since uh, the outbreak of, of the civil conflict in December of uh, 2013. And the persistence of this conflict, despite the repeated attempts to, to find a negotiated settlement, um, uh, has caused enormous human suffering uh, for the people of South Sudan. And just to tick off a few of the factors that uh, we've seen unfold, you know, as studies have shown, um, there are an estimated 400,000 people who have died since 2013 because of the fighting. Um, about a third of the population, 4.3 million people, have been displaced. About half of the population, about 6.5 million people, are facing acute food insecurity with some pockets of uh, a famine uh, in the country. The per capita GDP in South Sudan, which started uh, as one of the poorest countries uh, in the world in 2013, has contracted by 80% since that time. And all, you know, infused with all these factors is the rise of an ethnic nationalist governance structure in South Sudan. Um, and so, we want to take some time to look at some of these underlying drivers, you know, recognizing that a lot of the diplomatic attention in South Sudan is uh, focused on trying to uh, push forward the, you know, the latest discussions on the revitalized agreement uh, on the resolution of conflict uh, in South Sudan. However, you know, the premise of our discussion this morning is that unless some of these uh, fundamental drivers of conflict are addressed, uh, we're going to see uh, continuing uh, of the instability uh, within South Sudan. Um, we also want to draw attention this morning to the plight of uh, Peter Biar. Uh, Peter uh, is trained as an economist. Uh, he is the country director for South Sudan for the International Growth Center, and he's a longtime friend and collaborator with the Africa Center. Uh, Peter was arrested last July on charges of treason in South Sudan, and while those charges were just recently dropped, new charges were levied. Um, uh, allegedly, he, he's being charged allegedly for creating fear and insecurity in the public. For media interviews he gave uh, last year. He's being held at the National Security Prison uh, in Juba. And Peter's situation uh, underscores the challenges of generating independent analysis and expressing freedom of expression in, uh, in South Sudan. And so part of our goal today is to help create a venue to facilitate some of that independent uh, analysis um, our remarks today are going to be on the record, um, and in fact, we are videoing the event, which we'll then post on our website, uh, which should be available in the next uh, couple of days. I should say, though, you know, the, the views expressed today are those of the individual panelists themselves. They don't represent any institutional uh, position. So our procedure is going to be, um, we'll have each of the panelists speak for about 10 minutes, 
Uh, and then we'll open it up for comments, questions, and some back and forth uh, discussion. And I'll introduce each of the panelists uh, individually uh, when they speak. And so we're going to start with um, Dr. Luca Cole to my left. And uh, Dr. Cole is a professor of practice for security studies at the Africa Center. Um, and he's also an associate professor uh, at the University of uh, Juba in South Sudan and a global fellow at the Peace Research, Research Institute in Oslo. Um, among many of the things uh, Luca has done in the past, uh, he was the Minister of Presidency of Southern Sudan and a National Minister of Cabinet Affairs of Sudan. Uh, he was also a senior economist at the World Bank in Southern Sudan and was a founding, uh, a founding member of the South Sudan National Bureau of Statistics. So with that, um, uh, I'll turn it over to Luca for his remarks. Uh, good morning. <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Yeah, first, I, uh, I would like again to echo my thanks and gratitude to the uh, International Growth Center, and particularly great friend, Richard. Um, Richard Newfarmer, he's one of the people, director of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of IGC, and he's one of the people who really encouraged me and Sarah for this, uh, for this uh, book. But also, I would like also to thank the publisher. The publisher did a great job in a sense that they managed really to reshape the content of the book. And in fact, they, they, they decided to put the challenges of security as a key, because seeing all these articles, underlying driver, really security. And I just want to thank them for that one. But really, I would like to thank the Africa Center, the leadership of Kate, but in particular, um, uh, Raymond Gilpin, the dean, because for the first time ever, to have such a conducive environment for myself to deliver and to be productive, really. <laughs> and this book, book is a clear indication that I really managed to get a good conducive environment in the, in the center and the entire team of the uh, Africa Center. Um, I hope I will be able to do more <laughs> from being here. Um, um, but I would like to thank all of you for you to come here. I believe you have a certain affiliation and attachment to South Sudan. And this, this affiliation and attachment to Southern Sudan will continue to encourage us to look for how best we can see a better South Sudan. In fact, this book, it is part of the, of the central project um, uh, titled Envisioning a Stable South Sudan has becoming quite elusive to achieve such a vision of a stable South Sudan. And I would really encourage you to, if you can have, just take this, this copy, this, this copy of this report. It's a very, some of the things that we'll be discussing is actually well contained in a very systematic, and these are South Sudanese scholars, beside other friends, they wrote about South Sudan. How can we envision South Sudan to be a stable country? What's the title of the? Envisioning Stable South Sudan. I think it should be behind, behind there, I believe so. So, definitely the genesis of this book started when I was teaching at Juba University. And uh, we organized a series of lectures, issues to do with security development and governance, and I'm happy with us here, with Douglas Johnson. I started with Douglas Johnson by debating on issues of federalism. I think he's going to talk about, about that one. But it's for the first time that we created a space in South Sudan. And that one followed by the creation of the 20th state that resulted in my eviction from the country. But at least we managed to lay down a foundation for people to debate. And, and I think, and that is the idea of this book. They took to create a space for us to discuss some of the, the, key, the key issues. Ideally, it would have been good for us to have our first launching of this book in South Sudan. But we are aware the condition, conditions are not conducive enough for us to do what we hope that one day we'll be able 
to tell the stories of the book to the people of South Sudan. Um, although the rest of our, uh, the, the, the other panelists will be focusing on specific drivers, I will focus on the, on the evolution, but in a very brief way, of the security sector, class formation, and securitization of governance in South Sudan. We just want to bring the centrality of issue of security in governance. And I think it's shaping, it's not only South Sudan, but most of the African countries are facing the whole lot of security. And you could see clearly now what is happening to neighboring countries, Sudan, is a testation how best you can be able to handle the issue of security in governing. And this is what I would like to highlight some of the points about the, the issue of uh, the securitization of governance in South Sudan. And I don't want also to exhaust you with a lot of things, but just only to create a debate. And I think this is what, what, uh, what, uh, what, what Joe uh, said. I, I, one, of the, one of the most important, the one I want to start is the pre-colonial period, the society of South Sudanese, how they used to live without government. And by then it's a very clear case, the monopoly of violence was in the hands of the, uh, the youth. The culture of age set, but the age set for the youth entrusted to protect the citizen, the society, but even the properties. But this age set was under the control of the traditional authorities. And in fact, even I, we, we did some work with several world about the, um, the informal armies. And I, I, I wrote a piece about the, the challenge of the youth between society, state, and their cattle, and how the youth becoming navigating between these two, between these spheres. And, and what happened is that even for the youth, for them to go to violence, it has to be for a defensive purpose. And above all, they have to be trained to the Dinka values, the issue of dignity and nobility. And because it is not for the sake you go for violence, for the sake of violence. This is how South Sudanese society, and actually we did some work across the role of youth, even they, we might have heard about the, uh, the, uh, the Arab boys and also the white armies and then the, Ding, the Dinka youth. And it's reflecting to the, to the role of the year. Uh, and I think many people wrote about this, there's a lady called Sherry wrote about the, the, the role of youth and especially the issue of violence. So I just want to highlight what South Sudan with the traditional authority, they were quite resilient, quite peaceful. Then what happened, it is their contact with the foreigners that created a big shock into the relationship. And I think it's good that Douglas is here. One of the things, the whole lot of the excessive slavery and raiding and capturing of the youth, especially at the early stage of the Turkish rule, brought the culture of violence, not only the, the bringing of what is called hukuma, that's government, I think she mentioned it very well. Hukuma becoming synonymous with violence. And people start shying away from, from the government. Government is being seen, although the, the British colonial administration came in and then it started, uh, it started changing even the education itself. For, for the for people of South Sudan, Education was seen as a taboo, as in something related to the government, and, and that fearing even their children. So that is the genesis of how this, the, the, the militarization of the society started from the contact of Southerners with the foreigners. But I just want to, to, to echo also again that the, uh, with the coming of the colonial administration, especially the British, that was the first time education started coming in. and then. A, Children were sent by the sheep themselves to set an example because of this fear from the government. And that created a, a new society of uh, elites, or I could say the educated um, new class, basically from the, the, uh, the, uh, the sheep's sons or daughters. And then the first class actually started dominating the scene after the Addis Ababa agreement. But the beginning of militarization of the society started with the first civil war, in the 1970s, I mean, uh, in the 60s, and then peace agreement in 1972. But what happened, 
the rebels by then did not dominate the scene because what happened, what I call the senior civil servant, captured the state. But the rebels were actually not being given the chance to get into the power. So they were at the periphery of the politics and, 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 and power sharing. But the real shift happened in the Second Civil War, the emergence of the SPLA. SPLA becoming, having a very national agenda, becoming so dominant in the rural South Sudan, but even in Sudan. And the peace agreement that was signed in 2005, it was a clear case of handing over the power exclusively to the SPLM as a movement and as the army. Leave alone the power sharing was 70% to the SPLM, but the security sector itself was exclusively rendered to the SPLM. And what happened, there was a very clear dominance of one, uh, the, the, the army itself. It's not only in the uniform sector, but even in the civil service. And some of us have written about it. So the capture stayed by the year, uh, but it was, it, it is normal in most of the liberation movement. And what happened in South Sudan, the loss of the leadership, Espino could have played a very effective role to transform South Sudan. But Dr. John died. And that what happened, you have two ethnic groups, because the formation of the SPLA was in such a way the big tribes joined the, 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 the liberation. And then subsequently, the other one actually managed to capture the state. What my friend in this book, the, the, the gun class uh, by Majanga God, is one of the very good, he articulated in a very good way how the gun class captured the state. So it's becoming a big issue of how to desecretize the, the, the governance, whether the life, the culture, the life is in the hands of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the army. And that is a big challenge. If we don't address the issue of security sector transformation in South Sudan, Southern Sudan will not be on the track of stability and peace. And that's why the agreement, 2015 agreement that was signed was an attempt to address some of these security sector transformation. But yet it did not work because the security provisions in the agreement, the, the government was less willing to implement them. And that actually resulted in the, in the eruption of the, of the civil war in, in 2013. I mean, 2016, after the signing of the peace agreement. Now you could see what happened the very agreement was revitalized again. Security issues were not addressed adequately, especially the security in Cuba and a possibility of having a neutral body, a neutral body that can be able to provide security for the citizen in the urban settings. As we talk now, the government is not willing even to implement basic things, the release of, 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 of prisoners, or even the example of Peter Biar is a good example. Just minimum things. Leave alone not allowing for funding in order to, to fund a joint forces that they have agreed so that they could be, be trained together so that they can be able to provide security. Now we are going to be having a stalemate in a sense that how can you allow the opposition to go to Juba without such a security arrangement? Again, security is key. And I think the success or the failure will rest on how the security will be addressed. Despite all these things, I just want to conclude with some few, few points. One, I think the centrality and the priority of security is, is ex extremely important. And it's not only about reform in the security sector, it's about transformation of security sector. And I think in the agreement, there's a board being tasked to develop a national security strategy for South Sudan. In fact, in the center now, we use South Sudan as a good case study for the simulation of how you'll be able to develop national security strategy. And that has actually attracted a lot of attention for the year. For such a debate around how to provide sustainable peace to the people of South Sudan is key. And that can only happen by having a very conducive environment a policy direction 
a change of how things have been done in South Sudan through a debate, national debate around a national security strategy that can be able to deliver a sustainable peace to the people of South Sudan. Uh, let me stop here and thank you very much. Thank you, Luca. Um, uh, you got us focused right off the bat on the centrality of security and the security sector. So if we're going to see a sustainable peace in South Sudan, um, the issue of the securitization of governance is going to have to be addressed. And this is going to require um, some fundamental reforms in the form of uh, security sector transformation um, nested in a broader sense of what a national security strategy looks like for South Sudan. So some, some very important policy priorities uh, that you've put on the table. I would also um, mention for all those interested the report that Luca referenced envisioning a, a stable South Sudan um, uh, is available in the back, but it's uh, also available online for all of those uh, interested um, in, in taking a look at that. I'd like to turn now to um, Luca's co-editor for the book, The Struggle for South Sudan, uh, Ms. Sarah Loken who is um, a policy economist at the International Growth Center at the London School of Economics and Political Science. And uh, uh, Ms. Logan is a lawyer and economist. Um, she heads up the International Growth Center's fragility uh, work. So she works in multiple contexts, uh, not, in Af not just in Africa, but across the world. So looking at a lot of the challenges that fragile states face and transitioning states face. Um, and she has applied some of those lessons in her work on South Sudan, uh, where she has worked uh, for, for many years. So with that, let me turn it over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, I will be speaking on the challenges of identity and state formation, and particularly around managing diversity in South Sudan. Just to start off by saying this is a lot easier said than done, and a lot of these, these issues, there's evidence to suggest that things should work in, in theory, in practice. Some of these have been a lot more difficult to achieve in South Sudan. Okay, essentially, what, what would be key is putting in place a framework to really manage ethnic diversity. Diversity doesn't have to be an issue in and of itself. The question is managing it in an, in an effective way. And there, I'll talk about three elements of, of this framework that should be very useful. The first is power sharing, the second is group autonomy, and the third is a shared national identity. So power sharing and group autonomy can take many forms and how they should be developed in South Sudan should be very context specific. Power sharing would essentially see representation of all groups in political decision making and this inclusiveness, the idea is that it lowers the stakes of a winner-takes-all system, which is the source of a number of the political wrangling issues in South Sudan. And group autonomy would, would essentially give greater um, autonomy at a subnational level for groups to, to manage internal affairs by themselves, accommodating diversity, empowering different ethnic groups. The idea being here that you make unity more attractive by, by giving a degree of autonomy within the, the United Nation. And these elements essentially need to try and come through in any electoral system or system of government put in place in South Sudan. In terms of the electoral system, you know, there's quite clear evidence that, that a majoritarian system does not work in a diverse context such as South Sudan. So you know, this, this winner-takes-all situation is, is very problematic. At the same time, proportional representation can come with lowered responsiveness and accountability to the population. So South Sudan's system is actually quite well suited to it. It has a mixed system where 60% of the seats are, are appointed on a constituency-based system. So it retains that degree of accountability and responsiveness and then it's topped up by 40%, which are appointed on a, on a proportional representation system. So in theory, it's a very well-suited system. In practice, this hasn't really been what's been working in practice, partly because the, the arrangements agreed in the different agreements have actually surpassed the, 
a system that's that's there in you know in the constitution. So we haven't seen the system actually play out. And obviously there's also only been one election. So it hasn't it hasn't been seen to really work in practice yet. But this is something that in theory is very well suited for South Sudan. Um, where the problem comes more is with the system of government and how the highly centralized system in South Sudan with a lot of powers vested in the president is really not suited for a diverse country such as South Sudan. Um, options which um, Douglas will cover a bit more include federalism and, and decentralization. These in theory give, give greater both power sharing and group autonomy and in, in theory, they should work very well in this kind of context, but there are, you know, a big word of warning here, and some of this comes from work that Joe has done about the risks that these systems can actually pose in certain contexts, particularly where there are regional groups that are armed, where the government doesn't have full control over the country, um, where there's resource inequalities over the, the, the country and a history of ethnic conflict. Unfortunately, all of those are, are elements that are present in South Sudan. So we have to be quite careful about these different systems of government. And importantly, what Joe's work shows is the need to do a really comprehensive risk assessment where you look at the, the impact that any system could have on political polarization and, and ethnic tensions before you adopt it. So these need to be considered in various ways in South Sudan, but they need to be approached with a lot of caution because of the, the particularities of, of the conflict there. And then, well, one of the things that, that is a more straight shot solution that could work in, in South Sudan is really rethinking the upper house of parliament, the, the Council of States, it's called in South Sudan. At the moment, this council is not representative of the ethnic diversity in South Sudan. I think there are 50 seats and 30 are, have been carried over from the, the interim period with the other 20 seats being appointed by, by the president. So these are not appointed by either parliament or elected by the people. Um, so they haven't, they haven't come out as being very representative of, of the population. And uh, a rethink of that house, potentially along the lines of the House of Federation in Ethiopia, where there could be a representative of all ethnic groups in, in that house. The importance being that it's not done proportionally, but that there's equal representation regardless of size of, of the group um, to make sure that all voices have equal authority in, in, in that context and to particularly task that house with managing inter-ethnic conflict and, and really performing a mediation role where needed. The, the way the House is currently formed is, is a real lost opportunity in terms of managing ethnic diversity in South Sudan, and rethinking that upper house could have a lot of value. Importantly, a lot of the benefits that these systems have can only really be, be realized in a democratic context. So there's really a, a broader need to work on strengthening institutions and focusing a lot more on on institutions rather than individuals when it comes to leadership. It's only within a, a broadly democratic context that, that a lot of these benefits will be realized. The other, th the third la last issue is um, the issue of like a, a shared national identity. And this issue hasn't really been given a huge amount of attention, like particularly around the, the pre-independence and the immediate post-independence period, which again was quite a you know a missed opportunity given how diverse the, the country is this was a very clear need and as the state has failed in south sudan citizens have naturally retreated to their localized identities to a, a level where their security and other needs are, are better met because these are not being provided by by the state and certainly it's it's reached a point where exerting a sort of localized identity is actually a, an expression of exclusion from the state. So it, it, it has become very deeply entrenched, the, the idea of identifying more with your local area, your local community, than with the state as a whole. This, this issue is exacerbated quite severely by identity being very closely linked to territory in South Sudan. And the, the issue around internal borders not being fully established has really created a huge amount of scope for violent contestations over land. It's created scope for 
um, for leaders to really manipulate identity in order to you know, compete for resources. And these issues will continue to exist until these internal borders are set and it becomes very clear that they cannot be changed anymore. And with the president changing the number of states and then changing the number of states again, you know, this has really created an, an opportunity for, for ethnic groups to go out and really try and um, battle out over land in a way that has really ripped the country apart. And so coming up with a way that the borders must be set and it becomes known that they will not be changed again is really, really important for, for security and stability in South Sudan. How this is done is, is really open to, um, to what will work best. At the moment, there has been a committee, well, actually two committees established, the one to look at the, the issue of internal borders and another to look at the issue of how many states there should be in South Sudan. So the first has been established and apparently work is ongoing, but you know, it, should, it should be made very clear that the recommendations of those two committees need to be implemented in practice and not backtracked on. Whichever way they go about it needs to be clear that it can't be done in a way where the system can be gamed. You know, if, if you can't say we're going to set the borders as they are in two months time because that will open the, the floodgates for violent contestations. So it's either taking the word of these committees and implementing it in practice or using boundaries as set at a, at a previous time where it can't be changed. The problem with the, the latter example being that these boundaries have not really been clear in the past. So there is a lot of work that needs to be done on that. But on the issue of a shared national identity, it's, it's clear that a national dialogue is vital. And some of this work has been started. It's been led by the government, which is not ideal, as ideally you would have a neutral party leading it. Um, but for the, the system to be inclusive and participatory and actually lead to, to some buy-in of, of an identity as being South Sudanese is really important. Uh, there are a number of national um, nation-building policies, social cohesion policies that could be adopted and should be adopted and have been seen to really have some positive impacts in, in countries. However, these benefits often take many years to materialize. And so we're talking long-term um, long commitment to, to shared national identity and nation building here. Um, in the context of, of any sort of you know, power sharing group autonomy environment, there needs to be very clear balancing between self-rule and you know, a centralized government where enough is within the national government that unity is maintained. So this is a very tricky balance that needs to be reached in terms of giving enough self-rule to different groups that they feel that unity is attractive, but still maintaining a strong enough central government. Um, and importantly, also just to, to focus a lot on building the checks and balances and the, and the strong institutions needed for good governance in South Sudan. The, um, yeah, these reforms will take a long time to, to start really yielding any benefits, but it is a, a very important reform track to, to give a lot of focus to institutions and the checks and balances needed for good governance. So that is a very high level, and it's all, you know, in theory, things that we know that work. In practice, getting these to work in South Sudan will require very, very good understanding of the different dynamics in the country and meeting those dynamics very well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, that was uh, a lot for us to think about and uh, certainly we'll come back to that. Um, and uh, I think you've certainly helped uh, crystallize the linkages between um, identity and state formation and how that's playing out in the instability we see in South Sudan, um, especially when you have a government that is seen as party to the conflict and not a, a, a neutral arbiter of how the state would act. Um, and you've put a couple of uh, priority uh, policy issues there for, the, for us to think about, um, issues to do with uh, strengthening social cohesion, um, as well as um, the importance of checks and balances 
not just as a good thing for governance, but as really central to achieving stability uh, in South Sudan. So thank you. Um, next, we're going to turn to uh, Dr. Douglas Johnson. Um, uh, Dr. Johnson is a fellow at the uh, Rift Valley Institute, and uh, he is the author and editor of many works on uh, South Sudanese history, including uh, South Sudan, A New History for a New Nation, it came out in 2016, uh, and The Root Causes of Sudan's Civil Wars, Peace or Truce, uh, it was released in 2011. Uh, Dr. Johnson also was a contributor to the book, uh, The Struggle for South Sudan, um, and he wrote a chapter entitled Federalism in uh, the uh, in, uh, Federalism, the History of South Sudanese Political Thought. So with that, let me turn it over to you, Dr. Johnson. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Is that too loud? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I've been asked to discuss political leadership and accountability in South Sudan. And it is important to recognize that prior to 2011, um, South, Sudan, South Sudan and South Sudanese have had a long experience of working within state structures and being part of state structures in an independent Sudan. Uh, but as uh, Luca pointed out, the um, initial generation of the educated elite, the people who were eligible to be brought into the modern structures of, of uh, governance in the independent Sudan, uh, were mar marginalized. They were not part of um, the, uh, uh, they were on the periphery of power and politics, uh, very largely because they were not part of the um, uh, Arab elite and Arab Muslim elite that, uh, to whom power was handed over uh, at independence in 1956. So what you have had is an experience of being in government or participating in government, uh, but not necessarily being accountable uh, to any constituency. Uh, that uh, individual South Sudanese who have been a part of the state structure, whether as civil servants or as politicians, have in fact responded to a hierarchy uh, within government um, because they have been appointed and dismissed uh, elevated or demoted uh, by the people in charge of the hierarchies. We saw this very clearly, for instance, in the interrupted series of parliamentary democracies in Sudan uh, from 56 up to 1990, 1989, and especially during the period of the southern regional government between 72 and 83, uh, where although South Sudan was supposed to be what was known as semi-autonomous, uh, it was the President of the Republic who nominated uh, and uh, appointed not only uh, the, <clears throat> uh, who, who was in charge of appointing commissioners of, of provinces, of dissolving parliament in the South Sudan, of calling new elections, and manipulating elections for the President of the High Executive Council. So, Rather than being accountable, looking downwards to a constituency, uh, which is what one would expect in most uh, democracies, whether parliamentary or otherwise, um, the involvement of South Sudanese in the structures of state and governance were looking upwards uh, to those in charge of the hierarchy, in charge of the <clears throat> power was, was devolved down, was, was not actually devolved, but. Uh, to be someone to be involved in uh, sharing power in Sudan uh, before 2005 was very much a matter of uh, finding a place within a hierarchy of power, a structure of power that was uh, based in, a, in effect outside South Sudan. And Lucas pointed out that uh, the change to this came from the involvement of or the development in um, <clears throat> 
evolution of the SPLA during the Civil War where a different power structure was established within the country. It was a military power structure, uh, but again, it was not something where, it was not a, a structure where power flowed upwards uh, from a constituency to the, a leadership, uh, that a constituency that chose its leaders, uh, power flowed downwards from the hierarchy of the SPLA. And this was one of the problems that led to uh, the split in the SPLA in the 1990s. <clears throat> so there hasn't really been uh, um, a history of or culture of accountability. And uh, as Sarah has pointed out, you have leadership that um, manipulate differences, um, manipulate uh, grievances uh, of themselves in trying to create a constituency for themselves. Um, <clears throat> And this is one of the problems that has, uh, that has been highlighted with this uh, bogus federalism of the 25, 28, 32 states. Uh, these are not constituencies that have been demanding power or a devolution of power. These are um, networks of patronage uh, that have been created by, on the one hand, uh, the present government of South Sudan, and on the other hand, uh, the main opposition. Uh, the demand for uh, these states does not come from the people that live in the states. It comes from a leadership that is trying to create networks of patronage for themselves, uh, which would be a, a part of their exercise of power. And this is, again, has a long history in uh, Sudan before 2011. Uh, <clears throat> you had the first uh, attempt at decentralization in 1976 uh, when uh, Khartoum basically uh, divided each province of Sudan into two. Uh, so that you had from Darfur, you had north and south Darfur and Kordofan, north south Kordofan, east west Equatoria, uh, Jongle and Upper Nile, Baha Gazelle and Lakes. Uh, these were um, basically, um, there was no demand that came from uh, below that the government was responding to. To a certain extent, the whole issue of decentralization was for the central government to divest itself of responsibility for uh, development in the rural areas uh, by creating new administrative structures and then saying that the states would be responsible for their own development. Uh, the government, the central government, uh, managed to uh, <clears throat> withdraw itself from that obligation. And that was also what happened with the 1990s under the National Congress Party, the creation of state, uh, 10 states in South Sudan, for instance, uh, and creation of several states in uh, the rest of Sudan. Uh, again, the um, rubric, the ideology, or the excuse was this was a devolution of power, um, but in fact, making these new states and making them responsible for their own education, for their own development, but not giving them uh, the resources with which that, that could be done. It was just a, a really a shifting responsibility from the central government uh, to the states, but not shifting any sort of control of resources or powers to allow the states to carry out the functions that they were now told to do. <clears throat> so there has been a problem of accountability uh, throughout Sudan, through the experience of South Sudanese leadership. Uh, there has been a, a, a problem for uh, the citizens of South Sudan to be able to hold their leaders accountable, except in uh, violent um, eruptions, uh, now more often through the creation of new militias, new uh, armed opposition groups with new initials. Uh, and that has been the only way of being able to enter into uh, the structures and networks of power or to make leaders accountable. Now, I have to, <clears throat> I have to take issue uh, with something that Sarah said um, about the need to fix borders uh, 
so that they're not changed and that this will create stability. I think this is quite demonstrably uh, false. Uh, the issue of borders, as I've said, uh, has not come from people living within uh, the new states. It has come from um, the competition between uh, the opposition leader and the government to create new networks of patronage, to be able to appoint uh, governors uh, who then uh, appoint a cabinet and then uh, dismiss governors and the governors dismiss their cabinet. This is all that has been happening with these uh, states that have been created. You hear people are uh, appointed and a governor then spends his time appointing and dismissing his ministers. Uh, so on uh, one website, a minister in one of the new states office was a desk under a tree. Uh, this is not devolution, this is not accountability, uh, this is a sham. And <clears throat> having seen the work of the Transitional Boundary Commission, um, uh, that uh, report has been characterized by the head of JMEC as completely useless. Um, as my experience on the RBA Boundaries Commission uh, has taught me, boundary commissions do not solve political problems. It is only when political problems are solved that the creation or the identification of boundaries uh, is made possible. And in any case, the creation of fixed boundaries in South Sudan uh, doesn't take into account the realities of the movement of people and the movement especially of people and livestock, of the shifting of cultivation, of being having to take advantage uh, of changes in uh, the river levels where cultivation is possible, the distribution of water, the distribution of uh, pasture, etc. These change every year, and there has to be some sort of accommodation for that change. Uh, <clears throat> my own historical research, which of course goes back a good hundred years and has no relevance to anything we're talking about now, um, has shown something that I think has been forgotten uh, and certainly has been forgotten in this whole discussion of the uh, states and the boundaries. By the way, the Independent Boundary Commission doesn't really exist. And there's, there's a third one, which is going to be a referendum commission setting up constituencies where if people disagree with the boundaries, they're supposed to be uh, <coughs> solved through a referendum. Uh, and we've seen what's happened in, for instance, the UK, where a referendum has created a very serious boundary commission, uh, boundary issue and problem for the United Kingdom, which could eventually lead to uh, the dissolution of parts of the United Kingdom over time. So referenda don't solve boundaries, and why anybody could have thought that, I do not know. I think. The problem with EGAD is that they haven't learned from their own mistakes and from their own history, uh, and how they've tried to uh, replicate uh, the comprehensive peace agreement, which was between groups that controlled territory. And that is not what South Sudan needs. South Sudan needs a government that can hold the circle, so to speak, while the constitutional conversation takes place on how South Sudan wishes to be governed. And certainly what you have uh, in the history of federalism is that there have been demands for uh, greater devolution of power, but the systems that have been put in place still have central power, still have a president who appoints and dismisses. Um, still does not have a way in which uh, constituencies uh, or individual states can check, uh, uh, hold the central government, uh, check the power of the central government. So uh, I uh, will have to say that I'm very pessimistic about the revitalized peace agreement. Uh, because I thought that the peace agreement that they are revitalizing uh, was not going to work. It has not worked. Uh, I don't know how many vice presidents you really need in any one country, but we've got five in South Sudan. Uh, 
and it's a, a five because it is trying to um, find a, a way of, uh, uh, not a, a genuine way of devolving power or of sharing power, uh, but uh, again, working through a network of patronage. Um, <clears throat> I think I've rambled a bit from the topic, so I'll stop there. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Johnson. And uh, if you rambled at all, it was very interesting rambling. Um, uh, but in fact, you've set up uh, what I'm sure we'll come back to in our questions and, and comments um, and, and linking the historical uh, hierarchy of governance structures in South Sudan to the fact that a lot of the accountability mechanisms are upward rather than downward, and therefore, South Sudan has been bereft of uh, accountability structures to the general population. Um, uh, moreover, your uh, analysis of uh, the challenges of federalism and the designation of local jurisdictions being less uh, a factor of uh, local demand and, and more a mechanism of, uh, of uh, structures of patronage uh, is something certainly we want to talk about more. Um, and, uh, and reinforcing the point that despite all the discussions and, and various ostensible attempts at federalism, um, South Sudan remains a highly centralized uh, state structure or maintains a very high uh, centralized uh, governance structure, uh, I should say. Um, so we'll now turn to our, uh, our final panelist, um, uh, Ms. Kate Omquist Knopf. Um, and Kate is the director of the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Um, and uh, Kate has uh, been involved uh, in South Sudan issues um, for um, around 30 years or, or so, it, it feels like. Um, uh, but uh, um, uh, in fact, uh, she's held several uh, senior US government uh, positions uh, between 2001, 2009 at the U.S. Agency for International Development, including uh, as uh, Assistant Administrator for Africa, um, uh, the Deputy Assistant Administrator for Africa, and the Special Assistant and Senior Policy Advisor to the Administrator. She was also um, uh, the Sudan Mission Director for uh, USAID. And as part of those various roles, she uh, was part of the U.S. delegation that was involved in negotiations for the um, Comprehensive Peace Agreement uh, that was signed in uh, 2005. Um, Kate has been involved uh, in, in, in writing uh, on, very, uh, on various policy uh, issues having to do with South Sudan over the years. Um, and. Uh, these include uh, uh, publications she's written with the Africa Center, which again are available online, but uh, also uh, a very uh, uh, well-received uh, report she wrote with the Council on Foreign Relations entitled uh, Ending South Sudan's Civil War. Uh, Kate has also uh, test testified in front of Congress on South Sudan uh, numerous times. So uh, uh, with that, Kate, uh, please uh, share your thoughts. Thank, thank you, Joe, and all that to say that I'm deeply implicated uh, in where we are today uh, in South Sudan, for better or for worse. Um, but let me first uh, extend my welcome uh, to everyone and appreciation for you being here. Uh, we continue to believe at the Africa Center that uh, there can and will be a better day for South Sudan, and uh, hence the, the body of work and the conversations, uh, the platform that we seek to continue to provide uh, on uh, this crisis and uh, ongoing travesty, uh, in fact, in the country. I'm really delighted uh, uh, to see this book uh, come out and uh, commend uh, Luca and uh, Sarah, as well as contributors, Douglas and Joe, uh, for the amazing uh, body of work uh, and the other contributors uh, to continue to try and unpack uh, uh, relevant ideas and frames that uh, could better inform a pathway forward uh, for South Sudan. Uh, as well, uh, let me just uh, reiterate that this report uh, that uh, Luca and Joe have mentioned on envisioning a stable South Sudan is particularly to give voice uh, to South Sudanese. Uh, so Dr. Luca himself and then a number of other contributors uh, have particularly uh, uh, laid out uh, a different way forward uh, for South Sudan. Uh, 
Um, it falls to me to speak a little bit about external actors, uh, and uh, uh, to do so, uh, I want to, to reflect on how we've gotten to where we are today, uh, uh, very close to the next uh, milestone uh, uh, of sorts uh, in the uh, so-called peace process for South Sudan, uh, May 12th, uh, when uh, the uh, uh, next unity government is meant to, to be stood up. Uh, and to look forward, uh, because I think external actors have been uh, pivotal, uh, pivotal in uh, where we've arrived at, uh, and uh, will continue uh, to uh, factor greatly uh, into South Sudan's uh, pathway forward. And so I'll be very brief and overly simplistic, uh, just uh, in the interest of time, uh, and to get us into our discussion phase. Um, and just uh, uh, to start uh, with you know, noting that, uh, I, uh, not surprisingly, I think the United States uh, and uh, the Troika uh, countries of the UK and Norway uh, were, of course, instrumental in uh, helping to provide for the opportunity of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement and the end of the then the longest standing civil war uh, on the continent uh, between the North and the South. Uh, and a, a conflict that we should be reminded uh, had an extraordinary, extraordinary human toll and needed to come to an end. Now, a lot has been written and said, and you can find many of these resources on uh, what worked and what didn't work you know, with the Comprehensive Peace Agreement uh, and uh, that way forward. But uh, largely speaking, uh, the United States and the international community helped to define the broad parameters within which an acceptable solution could be found and that was critical you know, to arriving at uh, a final agreement. Uh, and uh, secondly, you know, the external actors uh, uh, from the United States and uh, other Western places helped to induce compliance, you know, to ensure that uh, uh, not every, uh, certainly not every step of that uh, peace agreement was held. Uh, one of the um, uh, positions that um, uh, I uh, was privileged to serve in, uh, in addition to being in Sudan as uh, the first USAID mission director upon reopening of the mission, was also to sit on the Assessment and Evaluation Commission, uh, the AEC, overseeing implementation of the, of the peace agreement for the first uh, couple of years. And so many things were not uh, implemented, but ultimately uh, there was a referendum and the referendum was respected uh, and independence uh, was granted uh, uh, to South Sudan. Uh, and that would not have happened without uh, external actors such as the United States and the international community more broadly insisting uh, upon those key steps uh, being reached. Um, to take us forward, I think uh, we stopped playing uh, that kind of role uh, after the outbreak or uh, even going into it, the independence period, but certainly after the outbreak of civil war in 2013, uh, where the international community and in the United States in particular failed uh, to um, constrain the options on the table. Uh, or uh, to say it another way, we failed to, to take an option off the table, and that was a repeat of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement framework of power sharing while sharing security arrangements. Uh, as uh, Douglas and others uh, far more eloquently and uh, compellingly can uh, explain, uh, this was not a framework uh, that should have ever been uh, applied again. Uh, and not surprisingly, uh, it failed. Uh, uh, the 2015 uh, agreement built on that model, uh, and now uh, we're, I think, on the cusp uh, of seeing uh, another failure of this same formula of power sharing for uh, the reasons the panel has uh, started to unpack here today. Um, mixed into this, of course, is the region, uh, the neighboring countries of South Sudan, who have been uh, uh, equally as important uh, all the way along uh, since uh, uh, the, at least the last two decades of uh, uh, South Sudan's trajectory, uh, and IGAD, the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, uh, and uh, uh, comprising the neighboring states and the mediator uh, of both the Comprehensive Peace Agreement and uh, the current uh, uh, agreement uh, for South Sudan. Um, uh, a lot could be said about the role of Sudan and Uganda and Ethiopia and Egypt in particular. Uh, the key thing to note, I think, for today is that this current revitalized agreement uh, uh, goes uh, a, a far step uh, further than the 2015 version of the agreement did in making Sudan and Uganda the guarantors of the agreement. Uh, we could have challenged and, uh, uh, that notion uh, even before we saw uh, current events unfold uh, to the point they have in Khartoum uh, today uh, in terms of uh, the wisdom of uh, Sudan and Uganda uh, with clear uh, 
uh, uh, equities uh, in uh, different ways, but uh, somehow finding uh, uh, finally, uh, after many decades of competition over South Sudan, finding some mutual interest in uh, essentially uh, uh, creating their own zones of influence uh, uh, in South Sudan and uh, taking so-called responsibility for the security arrangements there. Um, uh, clearly nothing much has arrived from the security arrangements, uh, so you know, we can see that that's uh, uh, faltering, uh, and uh, that they remain with uh, their um, domestic concerns as uh, uh, the top of their agenda, Uganda uh, being distracted internally, uh, Sudan obviously in a moment of uh, uh, historic uh, political transition and change, uh, and it remains to be seen uh, what uh, uh, the impact of that will be for South Sudan, and I'll come back to that at the end. Um, certainly, Ethiopia's um, uh, transition as well uh, is pivotal uh, in uh, what has happened uh, for South Sudan. And in fact, uh, Ethiopia, having led the EGAD uh, mediation uh, uh, for uh, the first uh, couple of years, uh, uh, I think uh, a critical stage was reached in 2018 when Prime Minister Abiy uh, handed over uh, uh, so-called uh, mediation of, of these talks uh, to Khartoum, and the talks uh, moved uh, to Sudan uh, and uh, were then rammed through uh, in, um, I think, uh, uh, a textbook fashion of what not to do uh, in negotiating a settlement uh, between parties. Um, Egypt, uh, of course, factors into this. Uh, uh, the Nile has long been uh, contested, and uh, certainly the development of uh, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam uh, and the prospect of that uh, being filled uh, has uh, uh, overhung, uh, overshadowed uh, uh, the dynamics in the region and between Sudan, Ethiopia, uh, Egypt, uh, and South Sudan. Uh, South Sudan found uh, alliance uh, uh, in, with Egypt uh, in uh, providing support to, to their position on the Nile. Uh, that resulted uh, critically in uh, facilitation of arms and ammunition uh, to the government of South Sudan. Uh, what, meanwhile, uh, Sudan and Ethiopia uh, found common cause uh, in their position uh, on the Nile and the dam. And so uh, we've seen uh, a dance uh, around that uh, unfold, even as this process of trying to mediate uh, the conflict in South Sudan. And certainly that has been a key factor uh, in getting us uh, to the, the, uh, the current agreement uh, uh, of where we are today. Uh, even more pivotally, uh, now and going forward, of course, uh, uh, are the broader dynamics uh, coming from the Gulf uh, and what we would call the Red Sea Arena. Uh, and uh, we start to see this uh, come into play even uh, while uh, this peace agreement is being revitalized and finalized in 2018. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, the United Arab Emirates on the one side and Qatar and Turkey on the other side uh, have been jostling uh, for uh, position, for influence uh, in the Horn of Africa for the last several years. Uh, Sudan is an opportunity of uh, enormous uh, proportions uh, for Saudi Arabia and UAE in particular you know, to uh, affect their agenda to try and constrain Iran uh, from Red Sea access, uh, from trying to uh, uh, contain uh, Turkey uh, and uh, Qatar's regional ambitions, uh, and, of course, uh, their interest in keeping Sudanese troops uh, flowing to Yemen uh, and fighting on behalf of the Saudi Emirati coalition there. Uh, and so that uh, is having uh, uh, a massive uh, impact, uh, as we can see uh, the daily news reports uh, coming out of Khartoum right now. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, Sal Bakir uh, has uh, been amongst the many uh, Sudanese and South Sudanese uh, leaders invited uh, to the Emirates uh, uh, in the last week, uh, and I think uh, not uh, more than five days ago uh, or so, uh, uh, visited uh, and, uh, and returned uh, from there. So certainly yeah, how that plays out in Sudan is going to affect uh, uh, matters for South Sudan. Uh, South Sudan economically uh, uh, and, and quite literally cannot stand uh, irrespective of, of what happens uh, to the north. Uh, and so uh, if Khartoum gets pulled uh, uh, one way or the other in that orbit uh, of the Emiratis and Saudis, or uh, conversely, we see a response uh, and a reaction from Qatar uh, in particular uh, and Turkey, 
uh, to what's happening in Khartoum, that will also play out in Juba, uh, and Juba will be pulled uh, as well uh, in uh, one direction or the other. Uh, and given the weakness of this agreement uh, and uh, the need for uh, the government to, to feed its patronage networks, it's very susceptible uh, to being pulled and swayed by uh, wherever those offers of assistance uh, and uh, influence uh, are, are being uh, proffered. Yeah, so I think um, going forward, you know, we see uh, far less um, influence uh, of the United States and the West at the moment and far greater influence of the Gulf and the Red Sea or region uh, more broadly. Uh, it's not clear uh, where other IGAD uh, uh, countries who have factored greatly in the past, uh, such as Ethiopia and Kenya, uh, will play in the future of South Sudan. Um, certainly what happens in Uganda continues to matter in terms of uh, President Museveni's attention and interest uh, in uh, especially uh, the Equatorias and the role that the UPDF uh, may be playing now and going forward. Um, but most pivotally, uh, pivotally is Khartoum and what happens in Sudan uh, for uh, external actors. So I'll leave it there and look forward to the discussion. I'm not quite done. Let me just uh, highlight, uh, uh, in fact, uh, 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 a report from the U.S. Institute of Peace uh, written by my husband, uh, full disclosure, uh, but also collaborator on all things uh, Sudan and South Sudan, uh, which uh, gives uh, an excellent analysis of South Sudan's civil war and conflict dynamics in the Red Sea uh, and even though uh, it came out at the end of last year, uh, remains very pertinent and relevant uh, to all of uh, uh, the dynamics uh, going on in the region uh, and more broadly for South Sudan. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, and uh, I think you know, in, in, a, in a very brief time, uh, really helped to uh, draw out how the uh, ongoing instability we've seen in South Sudan has always had some influence from external actors, uh, uh, whether it be Sudan uh, or other uh, now neighboring countries, um, and uh, how uh, these external actors will also have uh, an influence on whatever peace um, or stability trajectory uh, South Sudan might realize. And so it's really needing to having, that, having them on the radar as part of any policy framework for thinking about South Sudan and in many ways, the situation has grown more complicated with the uh, uh, increased engagement now of the Gulf actors. Um, implicit in what I hear you saying, too, is um, to help balance that, there's a, a need, as ever, for neutral, independent uh, uh, actors, maybe not from uh, immediate neighboring countries, to play a role uh, in helping to see um, through some sort of agreement that's going to be in the best interest of, of the country itself. Okay, so um, fascinating uh, presentations, um, a lot of different issues that we try to put on the table. Um, they're not exhaustive of the various challenges, the fundamental challenges that we've identified as drivers to the instability in South Sudan. Nonetheless, uh, a lot of... Uh, heavy issues to think about and, and, to, and to reflect on. And so for the remainder of our time, uh, we're going to have some back and forth uh, questions, commentary. Um, and so I invite uh, responses, questions from the audience. We'll take a couple of comments uh, at a time, and then uh, we'll give the panel a chance to respond uh, um, uh, as appropriate. So why don't we start uh, up here in front? If you can uh, identify yourself and your institution uh, when you ask your question, then you can wait for a mic. Uh, that'll be great. Um, uh, even though you might think you can be heard, um, it will be helpful for people in the back and for our listening audience. Thank you very much. My name is Cornelia Weiss. I'm a retired uh, US military colonel. And I am curious uh, whether the editors and or contributors considered putting a gender analysis to the framework in analyzing what's going on in South Sudan. Um, so certainly research exists that peace agreements that exclude women last uh, less time, and peace agreements that include women last, last a longer uh, period of time. And just simply on that fact alone, it would seem to me that a gender analysis would be 
um, important. Um, I would be curious to, to hear from all of you whether there is a difference um, with regard to who gets the spoils, who bears the burdens, um, who sits at the table, who's excluded from the table, um, who holds the weapons of violence, and who uh, is, uh, gets the effect of the weapons of violence. Um, and I thank you very much. This has been quite informative. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's go back here and to the middle. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kofi Dugwevi. I am a doctoral candidate at the University of Wisconsin Law School. Uh, I would like to thank you so much for inviting me for this uh, great panel. So I will have I have two questions, one for uh, Mrs. Uh, Logan and one for Dr. Luca. Uh, for Mrs. Logan, I think uh, you talk about national identity and uh, refer to the issue uh, around land dispute and suggest that fixing the internal boundary will resolve the issue. I will have to agree with Dr. Johnson that I don't think that will resolve the issue. Fixing those internal boundaries and creating new state will not, from my point of view, resolve the issue, but rather suggesting like a land reform. A land reform will have a way of fixing those issues than dividing or delimitating those country. And decentralization doesn't necessarily mean creating a new state especially when it doesn't come from bottom up. It doesn't come from the people. And then going to Dr. Luca, uh, you suggest that, uh, you mentioned that you're not looking for a simple reform, but the deep transformation of the army or the, the security you know, context in, in, in South Sudan. And I will refer to someone who talked about ethics of convention versus ethic of responsibility when it comes to countries that are going through a path of transition. It's a violence, you know, many people are refugee, displaced, deaf, and so on. In a such a difficult circumstance, ethic of responsibility should have a primacy uh, on ethic of conviction. Why I'm saying that? Because I think going through a deep transformation will last forever. So how about join you know, the unity government now and together do a work in progress in solving those issues one by one? Because those issues are not going to be solved overnight. They cannot be solved overnight. It's going to take forever to solve those issues. So how about the opposition join this you know, open hand of the President Kiel? and work together in pacifying the society. So thank you. OK, thank you. We'll take one more uh, question or comment. Sir? <clears throat> William Zarp from SICE. I appreciated Dr. Johnson's rambling remarks about rambling populations. Uh, but uh, assuming that boundaries are necessary, um, I'd like to hear how effective boundaries can be uh, established. What are you, is your advice for? setting up boundaries uh, in, in the conditions in Sudan. Let's uh, pause there, and um, uh, I'll ask the panelists to um, respond uh, and pick and choose the questions you think that are relevant, uh, that, are, that are raised, and, and that you think you have some added value to, to bring, and then we'll open up for another round. So why don't we just go down the table, and Dr. Johnson, that... Uh, Last question by Professor Hartman, Zartman was uh, uh, directed at you. Why don't you pick that up, and then we'll just go down the table. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Two types of boundaries to consider. One is basically administrative. What is going to be the administrative jurisdiction of any form of government, of local government? Um, <clears throat> and then you have not so much the boundaries, but the territory that might be used by uh, communities that are within that administrative jurisdiction. One of the, let me just say, uh, one of the historical 
lessons that I've drawn from my own research is the way in which during the good old colony days, uh, the what was in effect an alien administration realized that making administrative boundaries coinciding with tribal boundaries often created more problems than they solved. For instance, the creation of the boundary between the old Mongola province and Upper Nile province to separate the Dinka from the Nuer meant that whenever there was a problem that crossed that border, a raid, a <clears throat> cattle theft, or any sort of dispute between communities, this brought the provincial administration into dispute with each other. And you then had to have the governor general of Khartoum <clears throat> say to the governors of Mongola and Upper Nile, you better settle, you know, sort this out between you. And it, what then happened was the incorporation of the Dinka who were in Mongola province, in Upper Nile province, so that disputes between neighboring communities could be mediated by the same administration. This also, <clears throat> for instance, is the origin of what became the Abye problem of putting the uh, Nok Dinka, the Ruang Dinka, and the Twitch Dinka originally in the same administration of Kordofan as the Humor and Misaria Bagara, because there were a certain number of conflicts that had to be mediated and were mediated best by a single administration. What happens if you make administrative boundaries coinciding with the boundaries or at least the territory of communities? What happens when those communities get in dispute with each other if there is no mediating authority above them? The creation of several different so-called ethnic uh, states um, <clears throat> creates a problem whereby, in effect, the central government becomes the mediator between all of those states, uh, and therefore the uh, devolution of power to those states is um, negated by the um, <clears throat> overall authority of the central government that created them. Uh, there is also the problem of really identifying, um, I, I think that my former neighbor in Juba, Professor Julia Dwine, made a very good point when I was in Juba last February at a workshop I was at. She objected to this description of, uh, of tribal community, she, tribal boundaries. And she, decided, she said that she preferred to talk about communities and used the example, and she said, if you travel at night between the Lao Nuer and the Nyawang Dinka and go from one to the other, you won't know that you are in a different place because they form a single community, although they are different tribes. Um, and, and this business of creating ethnic states doesn't recognize that even in the old districts and rural councils, you often had a number of different communities, different language communities, and different uh, economic um, <clears throat> communities uh, that were part of a single administrative system. Uh, so you're asking me what would be an effective boundary? I would say the widest possible boundaries uh, to contain the greatest number of communities. That doesn't going to, isn't going to really help you probably, but I think that is the, the best way of approaching it. Just to pick up where, where Douglas left off, I, I agree fully with what Douglas has said in terms of the, the boundaries. Um, setting boundaries, when I was speaking about setting boundaries, it is for administrative purposes. There, there will be difficulty setting up local government structures if there's not clarity over administrative boundaries. These should not coincide with ethnic lines because that is where you start having very big issues over, um, over communities, over land. So in terms of cross-ethnic and as big a boundary as possible, I fully agree with, with Douglas on that. Um, I, well, one of the issues with this unity government that is due to come in, in in May this year, which is extremely close, is that there is still no insight into how local governance will work under it if there's no resolution on 
some degree of administrative boundaries on a local level. So that is something that will need to be resolved before a proper unity government could come into place or it will split local government from national government in terms of power sharing. Now, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by land reform as being a separate thing to, to setting boundaries. Uh, so I'm not fully able to answer the, the question, but, but certainly there, there shouldn't be a situation where administrative boundaries also determine you know, where people could graze or not. There needs to be a lot more flexibility for, for that, and that would need to be treated separately in some sort of either formally through resource sharing agreements, but as a separate issue from administrative boundaries. I'm not sure if that, that fully answers it. And apologies for not having been clear about the, the setting of boundaries just being for administrative purposes. For the, um, the gender lens in the analysis is, is a very big weakness in terms of uh, our approach. We, we didn't have a specific chapter on, on gender. It is a situation where women bear a disproportional brunt of, of the conflict without having a voice at the table. Um, they, yeah, they bear the, bo the burden without getting the spoils. And even getting woman representation, getting the voices in during the negotiating period in these peace agreements has been quite difficult. It is largely a, a male-dominated arena, and as a result, we see agreements that, that could have been improved a lot with, with female voices in the room. And yeah, I, I wish we had a chapter, particularly looking at, at the gender analysis. It is, a, it is an oversight of the book, and I apologize for that. Yeah. Uh, l let me come to the issue of boundaries. I think, and it is very important people to reflect about the peace agreement. And, um, I'm one of the people definitely there's no very right boundaries. It's about the relationship. And my own experience in, in, in South Sudan, even in IBA, is very clear that uh, Africans, they have a very flexible boundaries to accommodate themselves. Deterministic boundaries, definitely, these are quite alien to the, uh, the African context. But then in a modern state, you need to have boundaries. I think, like what, I mean what Sarah said. Then, some of the arguments we have been pushing, especially for the, uh, for the peace agreement, especially the 2015 peace agreement, asking the parties to go back to the 10 states. And it is surprisingly that even for you, yes, that's a very clear agreement. That what was existing, yes, we can build on. And the parties agreed, including the government of South Sudan, and then to negate it, and then to create about 28 states, 32 states. I think in this book, there's a chapter by Alex Dewan, and it's about the whole, the politics of the political marketplace and how you shift the burden and the, and the division to the lower level. And for me, it was, the intention wasn't a good intention for the people of South Sudan by creating these 20 28 state or 32 state. And it's a very good analysis of the, the dimension of why the policymakers decided to divide Southern Sudan to, those, to that number. And there could be a debate later on to what level can we be able to have the process of, of defining the boundaries. Uh, and, and it's surprising in 2018, as imagine, if in the African Union to say, you know, we are going to have the, the tribal boundaries. Who on earth, even on the continent, where do you have these boundaries? Which country is actually having such a, such a boundaries for the ethnic groups in, on the continent? No. And how can you be able to say that South Sudan could have such a, such a boundaries? And not only this, to say that in lieu of that one, you will be able to have a referendum. As Joe said, you have almost 60% of the people are displaced. How can you have such a referendum? So I just let us, that's the argument here, is just let us go to the basics and then to... The second one is the, uh, this idea, it is through this process, if you have almost 4.2 million people are displaced, 2.2 million are in the in refugees, 
it will take a hell of time for these people to come back because we are talking about the citizen. And there's no way you can be able to implement some of these provisions without the first thing is to help the people of South Sudan to return back to their, to their home areas before you could engage in any genuine thing. What are we seeing today is that even the very humanitarian assistance being provided by the external community, by the international community, is being denied to the citizen. And then it, this is a fundamental issue when you are talking about a, a political will for you to implement, leave alone the peace agreement, for a citizen just to come home or to allow such a citizen to access food is a problem. Leave alone to tell, to tell the opposition to come back because in the spirit of what happened in Vatican, then you'll be able to come and sit together, then you, everything will be fine. No, not at all. The test, I mean, it's a clear test that the government in Juba is not willing to implement the peace agreement. How could you convince now Riek Masha to come back? Very basic things, very basic things. One, look the issue of the, of, of the, of, of the, uh, of the states. Is it so difficult for Juba to accept simply, let us go to the 10 states? Is it, is it so hard? Second, is it so difficult for Juba to say, look, let us fund the joint force that they agreed upon? Do, do you think they don't have money just to train these people? The joint forces in order to provide security? And you are asking somebody like Riek Machar, who is a very good experience, what happened to him when he returned back in 2016? So you are telling him, no, because of a good intention, you come back so that you can, you can start immediately implementing. Third, as we talk today, prisoners of war and then the political detainees are still not being released. This is so much for the government to, to do that. So it's a reflection of lack of will for, for, to implement. And I fully agree with you, it must be incremental. We cannot rush, but there must be a political will and there's no way for South Sudan to stand by itself if we don't have leadership that can provide such a will and the commitment. And if we are going to mess up this agreement again, I think we'll be, we'll be showing to the world that, that we, we cannot govern ourselves. Let me stop here. Excuse me, Joe. I'd just like to make a couple of points in response to Luca. Um, <clears throat> One of the aspects of the RBA Boundaries Commission report, which has been overlooked, I think, just by about everybody, was uh, a very clear description that uh, Professor Shadrach Guto from South Africa made about the distinction between primary and secondary rights, dominant and uh, uh, dominant rights and secondary rights, which is the whole issue of what is a territory that a community occupies and has the main right to use, and what are the, the seasonal rights that another community outside that territory has to that uh, same territory. This is the whole issue about the, that we were looking at about the Miseria coming in to the Nokdinka territory um, in the dry season uh, to pasture and then to leave. Uh, and that is uh, an issue that is come, comes up in a number of different parts of South Sudan that has to be really confronted uh, so that secondary rights of a community are guaranteed uh, but don't uh, displace the dominant rights of uh, a resident community. That's, that's uh, I think, has to be brought into the discussion partly for land reform uh, and partly about uh, trying to um, get around the issue of boundaries. On, on the, the matter of gender analysis, it is quite true that women have a very restricted place in the political marketplace of South Sudan. They don't have much room to maneuver. You can see what has happened to, to people like Madame Rebecca or Angelina Tain, even within their own uh, political organizations uh, of how they have been rejected for no other reason than they are women. Uh, but there are areas where women have made a significant contribution because they have been excluded from the political uh, 
uh, arena, there are other areas that are absolutely necessary. For instance, my friend, uh, Professor Julia Duan, has set up a study center in a, a protection of a civilian camp so that university students can complete their degrees without having to go into Juba where they might be uh, in danger. And then there is the Roots Project, which was set up by women to uh, basically to generate uh, uh, income for women by reviving uh, the uh, custom, the, the, um, the beadwork uh, that South Sudanese women used to make and to extend it. Some of the beadwork uh, that has been made by women in South Sudan in the Roots Project sell for thousands of dollars in New York. Uh, and even uh, were used as part of the costume in the movie Avatar. So a nice blue beaded uh, Dinka corset uh, shows up uh, as part of the Avatar uh, costume uh, in Hollywood. Uh, so these are areas that are absolutely necessary for uh, creating stability within South Sudan. And it seems to be an area where women have made the greatest contribution, much more than men have in those, in those areas. Thank you for that, uh, those additional comments, uh, uh, Douglas. Uh, Kate, would you like to add a few words? Well, just um, briefly to the point of who gets to be at the table, you know, because this is the question of the day in Khartoum and will continue to be the question in Juba as we see what uh, I think uh, the consensus, uh, at least from, from the table, probably is a mostly unimplementable agreement uh, come uh, to its uh, uh, head here in the next uh, few weeks, possibly. Um, and uh, this is where you know, it behooves the international community, the United States, uh, the region, uh, more broadly, to um, get out of our past boxes in, in terms of how we think about uh, legitimacy and um, political settlements and uh, arrive at um, other transitional models that allow space and time uh, uh, more critically even for South Sudan, possibly than Sudan, uh, to find uh, the shared national identity uh, that uh, was spoken of and to have uh, a sincere national uh, dialogue and debate over what form of governance and uh, what objective uh, the government should serve the people of South Sudan. Uh, and that has become harder with each passing month and year of this uh, incredible uh, conflict and uh, distress that the people of South Sudan are facing. This is the largest refugee exodus on the continent since Rwanda. Uh, and uh, uh, it still continues to today. The death toll uh, from this uh, exceeds uh, 400,000 civilians, easily exceeds, according to the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, and uh, uh, we become somewhat inured to, to the level of human suffering uh, for South Sudan, and it requires a completely different paradigm uh, for figuring out a political settlement going forward. Uh, and yet we have timelines uh, both in the West and uh, even uh, at the African Union and EGAD level where we want to see uh, settlements and agreements reached and uh, uh, check boxes uh, to move forward. Yeah, but uh, uh, so far that hasn't succeeded for South Sudan. So we need to take a step back and rethink who gets to be at the table. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, let's open it up for another uh, round of uh, comments and, and questions. Um, let's start uh, back here. Uh, sir, yeah. Uh, thank you. Will Farajaro, Strategy for Humanity. Um, I guess my question is I'm looking at the, the chapters of the book and one of the themes that comes across or that I'm looking for is, is the question of uh, uh, freedom of expression, civic space. And many of you spoke to the issues of uh, viability of institutions. And I'm wondering about uh, the, the role uh, and the, uh, the uh, viability of, of civic space in holding institutions and political leadership to account. So I'd like for you to address that. Thank you. I think there's a question right uh, to your dear neighbor to your left. Yeah. My name is Brian Adebo from the Enough Project uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, my question is to Luca. Um, looking at the uh, reform of the security sector in South Sudan um, post uh, the CPA period, it was a disaster. Um, what essentially was at play was the establishment of a liberal uh, state building uh, project but that uh, failed entirely. Um, when you look at the uh, Constitution, the SPLA Act, the NIS Act, uh, they have very good stipulations on 
um, civic uh, military relations, uh, instituting uh, a civilian uh, oversight on the military. Uh, however, that has, of course, uh, not come um, to fruition. Going forward, uh, what should the role of the international community uh, be uh, in reforming the sector? Uh, we've seen that there was a massive involvement of the international community. Uh, the US itself uh, devoted more than 300 million to the process. Uh, Switzerland and Britain uh, offered training um, opportunities for the US South Sudan military. And um, there was also the involvement of these countries in the crafting of the Constitution itself, uh, the SPLA Act, um, and the Nice Act um, initially. Um, and when you look at the acts um, uh, and the Constitution, this is essentially the liberal state building project. But what happened then is we got, um, to borrow a phrase from Samuel Huntington, um, we've, we got a subjective military here. Um, the civic military relations process was circumvented. Uh, what we got instead was basically Salvo Kiir using the military to um, advance his political objectives, undermine what was in the acts and in the constitution, recruited a private army. Um, so going forward, what then should the role of the international community be in helping craft a new um, uh, security sector reform process in South Sudan? Thank you. Thank you. And then on, on this side, uh, sir, yeah, right there. Dane Smith from the American Friends of the Episcopal Church of the Sudans. Could you uh, comment on the role going forward of uh, civil society and uh, the church, the um, South Sudan Council of Churches has played some role, the individual Members of that uh, council have played some role, um, but uh, it diminished with the removal of the peace process to, uh, to Khartoum. Uh, what is the prospect going forward? And then if you hand the microphone to your uh, neighbor in front of you. Richard Newfarmer, the International Growth Center, and, and congratulations to, to Luca and Sarah on a, on a, on a fine book. Um, one gets the impression when you listen to Luca about the appeals for leadership and, uh, in, in South Sudan and look at the broader picture that there's an, if anything, there's kind of an entrenchment of the model going forward. There, I don't see where change is likely to come from. Uh, so my question to the panel is, uh, uh, where are the sources of instability when we see oil exports beginning to uh, increase, or at least in some variable level, providing rents to the system, we see uh, Uganda in a, in a rather entrenched position. Where, what are the sources that might destabilize the current situation to create opportunities for the international community, perhaps, to come in in a new way? Uh, and, and related to that, Kate mentioned the need for kind of thinking outside the box, uh, a new transitional model, I think is what you called it. What is that new model in the context of what might be new opportunities uh, for change in, in South Sudan? How do you see that playing forward? And particularly, what should the United States be doing that it is not now doing? Okay, thank you for those questions. We're going to pause, uh, come back to the panel, uh, and then panelists, if we could be brief in our responses, we'll have time for one more round. Um, so why don't we start, uh, Luca, with you? I think a couple of those questions were directed at you. And Kate, you might want to add a few things, and, and Sarah and, and Douglas. Again, feel free just to pick up those pieces that uh, you think you have some uh, added value on. Yes, very quick on this uh, civic space. I think this is a very big, uh, very important question. and. Uh, one of the things that I, uh, I was engaged in South Sudan, we were debating this National Intelligence and Security Act, a clear case of how the act itself was done in such a way to encroach to the very functions of the uh, narrowing the space for the uh, civic space, but even encroaching to the function, the normal function of the police being taken away by the, uh, but even contrary to the constitution. I think. It is through reforming the uh, reforming the, uh, the this act to comply with the spirit of the constitutions and 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 the and, and the and the fact that there is a need for civicness. I think it's a very important point. 
But this requires a lot of reform in the, uh, in the security sector, especially in the intelligence. This is where we may need to have a lot of work to be done. So that the, the encroachment to this civic space is virtually by the intelligence. And, and, and unless you reform the intelligence, you cannot be able to have such a space. Um, I, I agree with you, um, Brian, the, uh, what should the international community do differently in order to, to have a security sector that is really delivering a sustainable uh, security to the citizen? And I think this is a very important uh, question. One of the reform, uh, some of our own analysis about the reform that was uh, a generous contribution by international community in the security sector was that it is assumed that this sector needed just to be like a technical approach for reforming the security sector. No, no the security sector is about politics. By the time the international community were focusing on building the SPLM, in actual fact, the SPLM was was in such a way dominating by two ethnic groups. And, and, and unless you really focus on unpacking these, these, these the, the divisions in the SPLM, so you, you are investing in something that is not actually going to be sustainable. What could be done differently now, I think the international community, in actual fact, I could say they accentuate the, the, the division and the dominance of this gun class and the dominance of these two ethnic groups. And, and I think this is one of the things I feel is, a, is, a, is something people need to set back a bit and then, how can it be done differently? I think there are a lot of experience in a, in a situation whereby you have diversity. First, the most important thing is the, is the whole security agenda. And I think there needs to be a debate, what do we mean by the security itself? What are the real challenges facing South Sudan? Because this is going to have implications the way resources are used. Definitely, can, is it possible? I think uh, those of you, they did a very good job on, on, the, on, on, on the representation in the security sector. And one of the good things in this, in this agreement is the very fact that you have to set up a clear criteria of who to be involved in the security sector, a very objective criteria. Second, it is very important also at the same time to, to, to see the representation. Of, of the security, of, of, the, of the different ethnic group. Third, it is what should be the size of the army that you need. For example, they met the, the, the board, the, the security committee, they met, and they have decided to establish 400,000, about 15 uh, uh, divisions. 400, I calculated about 400,000 that they need for South Sudan. And you cannot just decide such a thing, just a group of people sitting in Addis Ababa to decide the size of the army. So these are some of the things you need to, to, to take into account. But I think having a national dialogue to engage in the, uh, in the debate about a national security strategy that can be reflective to the needs and value of the challenge of people of South Sudan, I think that process should be, should be encouraged. I think, well, let me give the, the rest of the... Um, sure, just on the, the role of civil society and the church in this whole process, certainly on a local level, they have a much greater presence than national government does, and this gives them a very important role in particularly the national dialogue, making sure that it's inclusive and participatory on a local level, that it involves all voices. Um, also potential roles for monitoring, implementation, various things, but certainly needs to be included in the whole process a lot more so that their role can be clearly defined. But having a, a presence on the local, the local level gives them a very important role in this. And then just in terms of the viability of the civic space to, to hold institutions to account, ideally there would be the space. It isn't there currently in South Sudan as seen by the political detainees you know, you get, you get arrested for trying to hold anyone to account. But this really needs to be opened up and improved upon a lot. There can't be a national dialogue in a, in a context of, of people being detained for, um, for sharing their opinions, for stating what kind of a country they want South Sudan to become. There needs to be a lot more tolerance and openness in, in that, and, and specifically protecting the role of freedom of expression. Two points. Um, 
One will be an incremental change as the liberation generation passes from the scene. And that might take some time, but if you look at the history of the United States, how long the revolutionary generation was in charge of politics in the United States. John Quincy Adams was a teenager when he was helping his father in the diplomatic efforts during the revolution, and he was, I think, the last of the revolutionary generation to be a president. Look at the uh, role of uh, the Grand Army of the Republic and the Union veterans post-Civil War. Uh, William McKinley uh, was the last uh, army veteran to become president. Uh, so it's going to take a, a while for, for that generation to pass on and be replaced. Uh, but you do have civic society, civil society groups, especially things like Anna Taban, uh, that are driven by uh, younger people, by a younger generation who really want change. Um, and as far as the role of the churches, it is quite true that the churches are very important on the ground. And the older configuration of churches, uh, the denominations that form the Sudan Council of Churches and the New Sudan Council of Churches, uh, did find ways of working together. But there are uh, new religious organizations coming in. And you do have the influence of uh, evangelicals from the United States and these can be divisive. Uh, these can set up uh, divisions within a society and within communities uh, that I think uh, needs to be watched very carefully uh, because the role of uh, the churches, uh, while generally positive, can also be negative uh, in their uh, uh, search to acquire uh, new converts um, and the sorts of things uh, that they will try to impose on new converts, which would divide them from their communities in uh, ways that are quite unnecessary. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, we'll take one more round. Uh, again, uh, if people can be precise with their comment and question, uh, and then we'll wrap up uh, from the panel. So sir, back here in the middle. I'm Major Joey Sangari from Malian Army. And I would like to thank uh, the panelists for their uh, brilliant presentations and also thank the African Center for inviting me. So I will have two questions, one for the two editors and one for Dr. Johnson. So uh, I just read the executive summary and there is a part that caught my attention you quote the UN Secretary General uh, who stated that uh, he has never seen a political elite with so little interest in the well-being of its own people. So I uh, would like to know with regard to that comment and also uh, from your own viewpoint, uh, is there like optimistic ground enough or sufficient op optimistic ground in the book uh, for a better Sudan without uh, a, a political will? And my second question will be for uh, Dr. Johnson. So in the chapter six, I sense a kind of regret uh, regarding the cessation of South Sudan from the northern parts. So if we could go back in time, will you recommend uh, to South Sudan to not see it from the, from the north? And also, if you have to provide a sequential order uh, regarding the uh, security sector reform, the political reform, and the economic reform, what will that order be? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, and thank you to the panelists for really superb presentations. My name is Vivian Lowry Derrick, and I run a small NGO, the Bridges Institute, that focuses on strengthening African governance and democracy. And my question is about youth. Um, we're, we're all aware of the bulge and African youth now becoming much more assertive. 
talking about the distinct the difference between leaders um, and youth being 47 years on the, the continent. So I'm wondering in the case of South Sudan, um, are youth involved in one trying to shape a national identity if they have a different um, viewpoint of, of the world? And are they um, demanding a seat at the table or and are they involved in some of the um, um, non-state actors that are um, militants? I also was wanted to um, just add on a little bit about civil society. Is civil society demanding basic services like education, et cetera, at the local level? Thank you. If you had your microphone across the aisle here, and we'll get a question. Good morning. I'm Gia Cromer from National Intelligence University and also a PhD student at George Mason University. First, uh, thank you, Dr. Johnson, for highlighting the problems in, and pro uh, of decentralization and patronage networks. Um, one question that I have for the two editors is regarding uh, two bodies of research, one regarding the massification of education and the importance of education in building democracies, and also um, edu uh, ed education research that I've done regarding um, the lack of mention of national identity in national education plans. And I was wondering whether or not it's possible for the inclusion of traditional systems using the nexus points of various ethnic groups for creating positive national identity. And my last comment, I believe, uh, my last question, I believe, actually would be addressed by Ms. Knopf, but um, had to do with uh, coherent disengagement um, for better conflict management um, to, to help stop possible conflict recidivism. Thank you. OK, and I think there might have been some problem hearing those questions. So just briefly, she's asking about uh, the role of education uh, and the importance of education for facilitating democratic change in South Sudan, uh, the importance of education for national identity. And uh, she's talking about the issues of recidivism uh, and, uh, and how that affects uh, the, the situation we're looking at in South Sudan. All right, there was one more question here. We'll make that the final question, and then we'll get the wrap-up comments from our panel. Thank you. So Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Ibrahim Dingakoy uh, from the World Bank. Uh, Dr. Luka Byung, I would like to ask whether you look at the role of the legacy, the role of the legacy of the security sector within Sudan or Uganda or Ethiopia, most of which uh, have trained uh, a lot of uh, security forces from South Sudan, and whether there are conflict in terms of values. Uh, you mentioned the culture of violence, and I would like to maybe take an exception of that, because if you, you, you lay out very well, from the Ottoman Empire to the British Empire, and then to Anyanya, and then, then it was very unfortunate to hear that there is indeed a traditional culture of violence, which I think is, is, is not there in most of uh, South Sudan. Because where I come from, as you know very well, a youth, youth can never go to war or to fight unless actually the elders uh, say, okay. And there are cases where youth who really want to go and fight somebody, but they had to back down because elders have actually said no. So I am actually wondering whether the role of the SPLA in the way it had diminish, diminishing uh, the traditional uh, authorities, whether that has an impact in actually uh, destroying the foundation of which we, 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 we could have, uh, have as a country. So the SPLM is, is not as powerful in the, in the countryside while the traditional leaders have been actually made powerless. So can you connect the two and whether they can contribute to this kind of uh, prevalence of violence? Thank you. OK, uh, thank you for all those questions, comments. Um, so uh, we'll get final responses from our panel. And I think what we'll do is, um, Kate, I'd like you to go first, uh, and then Douglas, uh, 
then Luca and then Sarah, I'll have you, you get the last word for, uh, for today. Okay, well, uh, thank you everyone for uh, an amazing uh, set of uh, questions and um, uh, again for your interest uh, in being here this morning. Um, I uh, will respond to, to Richard's earlier point and, and just uh, sum up a few things uh, by saying that um, the U.S. and by extension the international community should be shaping the range of acceptable solutions or formulas that are on the table for South Sudan. Same is true for Sudan. In fact, you know, this should be informed by lessons of the past, uh, and we have many lessons of the past, uh, both good and uh, bad. Uh, and uh, uh, I think a robust uh, body of work uh, uh, to, to draw from there and a number of conversations that we've uh, tried to, to uh, um, uh, uh, contribute to over time. Um, this range of solutions should factor in the legitimate political and security interests uh, of the neighbors. Uh, there are some legitimate interests there. Uh, they have not been well managed, and so uh, therefore we see them managing uh, their interests in, uh, in other ways that uh, have less productive, less constructive uh, outcomes uh, for uh, South Sudan in, in this case. Uh, and so uh, all of that is to say that uh, we should be providing the incentives or disincentives uh, to uh, 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 implement uh, any uh, frameworks, any peace agreements, any commitments that are made uh, towards uh, stabilizing this country. Uh, I do not think that we have the uh, requisite ingredients uh, right now uh, in the current uh, framing uh, of uh, so-called peace uh, uh, to get there. Uh, and so it will be incumbent uh, to continue to, to look for other ideas going forward. Uh, and f uh, again, to, to go back uh, to South Sudanese ideas first and foremost uh, for what they see as a transitional model uh, that would have viability, that would have credibility for their country, uh, for their various constituencies, uh, uh, and all the voices that need to be heard. Uh, this uh, report that we've highlighted is one piece of that. The Africa Center and the U.S. Institute of Peace have uh, collaborated with some of the authors in this report to, to look at um, technocratic uh, forms of transitional governance uh, for South Sudan. Uh, others have done work. Uh, this book uh, uh, of uh, uh, Luca and Sarah's uh, furthers our, and deepens our thinking uh, about uh, key elements of that. And, and so uh, we, we have to do uh, uh, the hard work and uh, uh, put all the creative juices together to find different models uh, uh, for transition going forward. I have written in the paper that Joe mentioned uh, for the Council on Foreign Relations about uh, 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 so-called crazy ideas of borrowing external legitimacy and competency for a time uh, for a country in such dire straits as South Sudan. I still believe uh, that that is relevant and uh, it needs to be considered, if not in whole, at least in part, in order to give the breathing space to find national identity, to rebuild trust and social cohesion, uh, to decide whose security matters and what institutions and actors are needed to provide that for the people of South Sudan. Uh, so uh, there's a tremendous amount of work uh, out there and, and then we need to continue to, to further uh, uh, and build upon. Um, and then just uh, finally to say that um, uh, uh, to the question of youth uh, uh, that uh, is so important uh, and, uh, in fact, again, uh, really just the egregiousness of Peter Biar's uh, arrest and ongoing detention and others like him, he's not the only one, uh, is a sign of how threatening uh, this current regime, threatened this current regime is by uh, the youth who are trying to advance uh, a different uh, uh, construct uh, for their country and to find a shared national identity and to build towards a, a different uh, South Sudan. Uh, and so uh, first and foremost, we need to see the government of South Sudan release Peter and everyone else being held in detention for these political reasons. Yeah, and uh, secondly, um, I think uh, uh, Sudan will be very inspiring for South Sudan. Uh, Sudan is pivotal for the country, uh, for South Sudan going forward for, for lots of reasons. Uh, uh, one of them is that uh, uh, South Sudan draws lessons uh, uh, for good or for ill uh, from Sudan uh, and uh, 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 behaviors, uh, et cetera. I think uh, what is happening now uh, in Khartoum and uh, with uh, uh, nonviolent uh, civilian protests uh, will be very inspiring and interesting to see uh, what lessons our South Sudanese colleagues uh, draw from that and, and how they uh, take inspiration uh, further for their own country. Uh, right. Would I recommend secession? Um, well, of course, I wouldn't recommend anything, but um, <clears throat> the comment that you're referring to, I think, is was written in the context of other things that I have written about the 
uh, failure of self-determination for the Sudan as a whole. There never was a self-determination process uh, for Sudan. So there never was, at the very beginning of Sudanese independence, um, a real dialogue about a Sudanese national identity. And that's one of the problems uh, that led to uh, two civil wars and the independence referendum. Now, the way in which the referendum was set up it was either the system of government as set up by the um, Comprehensive Peace Agreement or independence. And the system of government that was set up by the um, uh, CPA uh, didn't address, again, the issues of national identity and where would South Sudanese fit into it? Where was, what was the place uh, the, uh, of South Sudanese? Now, if there had been a different formulation of government, um, there might have been more of a, an idea of staying within a uh, united Sudan, because the two countries are not geographically separate. They're not economically separate, and they're not um, uh, culturally separate, despite what uh, some claims have been made. Uh, and they're going to have to find a way of collaborating, which they haven't yet been able to do, uh, but they will have to as two independent countries. Um, and <clears throat> if, if, for instance, the uh, NIF had not pulled their coup in 1989, uh, Garang and Sadiq were supposed to meet uh, to begin to talk about uh, a peace agreement. And at that time, South Sudanese uh, independence was not on the table. It was not part of an SPLA, SPLM pro policy. Uh, so by preventing that peace agreement, uh, because the NIF wanted uh, to eliminate a southern voice that would have um, prevented the creation of an Islamic state, uh, they set the Sudan on a path to separation. Um, and it's always a matter of what is the choice and when is that choice offered. Now, um, as far as uh, what I would recommend, I mean, I'll, I'll just go to the other question really about youth involvement. Um, we've seen in organizations like Anataban, which is a youth movement, and they're trying to use art, theater, um, uh, music uh, to address the issues of violence and national identity. But you also have um, a more diffuse group of youth who are living outside of South Sudan uh, who are getting skills through education and through uh, jobs who can bring eventually uh, that experience, a much needed experience uh, to South Sudan and many of whom intend to return. Um, I, I, I met a number of uh, Australian South Sudanese last year <clears throat> or the year before and there were policemen, uh, lawyers, uh, various others. Now, they had to deal with integrating themselves to become good Australians as well as South Sudanese, but they also wanted to bring that experience back to South Sudan. So I think the kind of two prongs, the youth that are in South Sudan now and the youth that are outside but will be coming back in some way. Thank you, Douglas, um, <clears throat> and then Luca. Yeah, let me start first about the, um, whether there's a hope, optimism in such a situation. And I think this is a very important question. Uh, let me say the following. I think we should not underrate the resilience of the people of South Sudan. These are the people who really fought a war uh, that I, I think with, 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 with a lot of sacrifices. And the decision for them to have an independent South Sudan came as a result of, of such a struggle. So it is, it is uh, I'm one of the, I, I believe, because of that determination of the people of South Sudan, the wealth and resilience that can make people of South Sudan actually being let down by its own leaders and their own leaders. And, I, and, and that's, that's the starting point for me, the optimism in the will and the determination of the people of South Sudan. The, why I say the elites is the fact that if the, the, the statistic provided by, by, by Joe, half of the population is, I mean, is just displaced. We have almost the level of, of uh, food insecurity, the level of atrocities, 
it's a clear, it's clear, a clear case of the failure of leadership. Uh, it's, not, it's not the people of South Sudan. The leadership actually failed the people of South Sudan. And this is something that we, we, I would like just to highlight very... Uh, uh, the, so for me, that is the optimism I have about the, about the determination of the people of South Sudan. And we should build on what they have at the level of resilience. Uh, the, the second point is about the... Uh, I, Abraham, I agree with you. I think the violence we are seeing in South Sudan is an outcome of public policies. It is not the people of South Sudan. It is the way people have been managed it resulted in such a violence to come out. And I, let me put it differently. South Sudan as a liberation, I mean, as well as a liberation movement, what happened is that you have a very good example of liberation movement that succeeded to provide good governance and security to the citizen. For one factor, issue of institutional leadership, leadership is key in making the difference between the different, the different outcome we are seeing from the liberation movements. So when I am talking about the issue of the year, and I agree with you, actually many studies have shown the resilience of traditional institutions. And as we talk today, the providers of reconciliation, the providers of security, a feeling of longness, these are the traditional institutions. It is when you have these, the, even, even studies have shown an common issue for youth, actually it has been shown even the youth are caught up between the government and their communities and which values. Sometimes they are invested or recruited in the formal institutions, but always they come back to their own values at home. So you should, it, it, they may be seen as becoming part of the of violence, but in actual fact, they are guided by their own morality and the values of their family and their community. And that's what happened. I could see clearly the mismatch between the governance being delivered to the people of South Sudan and the, and, the, and the values that the people of Southern Sudan are having. It is because of these institutions, Hakuma, that is actually limiting the goodness of the citizen. And that's why Hakuma, or the government itself, becoming the central point for us to see the goodness of the people of South Sudan. And, 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 and that's why the, the idea of, uh, of, of we need to be critical to ourselves so I'm not even blaming, it's not about where, it's not about Dinka. It is about this, this, this political leadership and the government that we are delivering to the citizen. And I'm so hopeful. I mean, people of South Sudan, one day they will rise up and they will see their potential and, they, and, they, and how much they have to offer to themselves. Let me stop here. Thank you very much, Luca. And then uh, Sarah. Just to cover some of the, the points that have been touched on, well, the importance of education definitely is recognized in South Sudan. The displacement and the ongoing conflict has meant that there are a lot of children who are not in schools. And when the guns are silenced and, and peace is established, massive investment in education will be key to the country's continued peace. I mean, there's a lot of evidence showing that the more educated a population is, the, the greater the chances of maintaining stability once conflict has ended. And also for South Sudan, it is key in terms of economic diversification, creating job opportunities beyond oil, and really raising incomes in the country. A good education is vital for all of that and could be a, could, a good conduit to building a national identity. And then just on the, on the youth question... They're, they're, as Douglas mentioned, Anna Taban, but also like South Sudan we want, there are a lot of youth-led civil society groups who are doing amazing work. But beyond that, youths are also the, the main militants in the conflict that's going on. The people who are fighting and who are dying every day are young people. And for that reason alone, they should have a much bigger voice at the, at the negotiating table than than they currently do. Um, the negotiating tables have been dominated by, by much older people who are not the people on the front lines every day. And the role of the youth really needs to be, it's not just civil society, it's the, the active involvement in the ongoing violence. Give them a very, a very big need to have them at the table in terms of, of reaching a peace agreement that makes sense for, for the young people of South Sudan. Um, but just in terms of talking about hope, the, the main thing that gives me so much hope about South Sudan is its young people, particularly its young women, if I am to be, <laughs> to be biased and honest here. The young South Sudanese activists, 
and friends that I have are some of the most incredible people I've, I've ever met. And they give me a lot of hope for the country, knowing that there, there are young people like that in the country who care so much about the future of South Sudan and, and reaching peace and maintaining that peace once it's reached. And a lot of support going into building up the youth to, to lead the country tomorrow would be a very, very good investment. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, please join me in, in thanking our panelists for a very thoughtful and reflective uh, presentations. Uh, as advertised, uh, their years of experience working in South Sudan certainly uh, shine through in terms of uh, helping us understand some of these uh, uh, underlying fundamental challenges that South Sudan faces, as well as putting forward some uh, solutions and some policy priorities that uh, need to be addressed if uh, South Sudan is to reachieve uh, stability. Um, uh, I know several of you still had questions, uh, so when we're done, you may have a chance to um, uh, touch base with some of our panelists and, and, and see if you can get your questions answered. Um, I believe we may still have a few copies of the book, um, The Struggle for South Sudan, back. Um, so feel free to pick a copy up if interested. Um, and, uh, likewise, um, for the uh, report that we referenced, uh, I think some of you came in later. Uh, this was uh, Africa Center report uh, envisioning a, a stable South Sudan. I think there are copies in back, and they're also uh, available online. So with that, let me draw our session uh, this morning to a close. Thank you all for coming out and for a very thoughtful exchange. <laughs>